Okay. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Dale, and uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Robert, and uh, thank you. I'm so apologize for the delay. Uh, I really like this. I, my, my my talk would be nothing without this PowerPoint. And, uh, it's also my duty, uh, uh, you know, being a Mohawk for, for my community, and uh, of course, I like to take uh, 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 to be um, uh, honored to be in the land of the, uh, of the Squam Squamish people here, and uh, and I also bring greetings for, from our chiefs, our clan mothers, and the men, women, and children of the Mohawk Nation to you, to your people, to your uh, leaders, and, and your children, and, and uh, we hope that all of us will will uh, go, go together, you know. Uh, side by side and into, into the future. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about here is we're going to talk about the future. Although I'll be talking about the past, we are always looking to, to the future, and particularly into the, our, our, our children. Uh, people ask me, um, well, how, how come you're involved in international stuff? I mean, it, it, nothing ever happens. And, and I always tell them, you know, we, in our tradition, we have this whole uh, um, uh, prophecy of the seven generations, you know, that we always got to look when you make a decision, uh, an important decision, we always have to look seven generations ahead over what the decisions you make now, what impact will it have on, on seven generations. And, and, and UN work is like that, because UN, the UN moves uh, you know, slowly, uh, like a glacier, but it does move. You know, and it might take seven generations for that glacier to move somewhere, but uh, that's what we do, that we have to look at that. And that we have to take the long view when you're doing international work, because nothing happens uh, overnight uh, over there. The slide that you, you, you see uh, behind me is, uh, was taken in 1977, and I'll get to that uh, uh, before, but uh, just before we lose this, this is uh, uh, when the indigenous people uh, walked into the United Nations in, in 1977, when um, uh, uh, a, an NGO meeting was called on the um, racial discrimination against the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. And uh, in this picture are a lot of, uh, uh, um, uh, um, some of those leaders, and we all, uh, they all went there. I can't say we, I wasn't there in 77. But uh, these, uh, uh, all these uh, uh, people uh, went to Geneva and walked into the main, uh, into the, one of the main archways into, into the front of the, of, of, the, um, uh, uh, of the United Nations in Geneva, and that's where that, that, that picture is, uh, is taken from. Uh, there's a Philip Deere in the center, he's a Lakota elder, uh, the uh, Tadaho, and there's, there's a number of people in there whose names are escaping right now. But uh, uh, these are the people that really opened the doors of the United Nations in, in 1977. But first, I want to go f a little bit further back. I'm, you know, I'm talking from a Haudenosaunee perspective, from the people of, of my people. We call ourselves the Haudenosaunee, which means the people of the Longhouse. And also, you know us more uh, as the, um, the, the Six Nations Iroquois Confederacy is, is uh, who, we, who we are. It was a Cayuga chief, traditional chief from uh, Six Nations uh, uh, Reserve. And uh, he went to the League of Nations in, in 19... In 1923 and uh, 1924, um, the uh, uh, the uh, the Six Nations had a um, have an agreement with the Canadian government that, that had uh, uh, land in Ontario uh, called the Haldeman Deed, and and Canada was violating the agreement uh, that that the Confederacy had uh, over, over this land, uh, and um, uh, the Confederacy could not get uh, satisfaction out of the Canadian government, so he decided to take his problem to the League of Nations. Because we believe that we are sovereign people, that we're not subjects of Canada, you know, but but an independent people, we uh, this guy was sent to 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 the League of Nations to to bring this complaint uh, forward. You know, uh, there he wasn't the only one. There uh, there was also another gentleman uh, named Ranata from the uh, uh, was a Maori uh, spiritually who went there a year later in, in 1925 also to talk about the situation of the Maori people in in New um, New Zealand. When we sent them to uh, to, to Geneva, uh, we, you know, we because we were sovereign people, we didn't we didn't ask for Canadian travel documents. The Haudenosaunee gave him his own uh, letter you know, and when he uh, when he went to Descahe. Uh, something that we continue to do uh, uh, today. Uh, today, so he wanted to address the, the the League of Nations. And when he went to Geneva, uh, he you know he had to lobby, he had had to talk to people, and he was supported by by. Uh, uh, by a number of, of, of states, uh, the, the Netherlands, uh, Japan, and, and Persia. Persia today we know as Iran. Uh, when Canada found out they was there, Canada was was pretty upset about that, and they were upset because here you had, uh, you know, a bunch of Indians uh, acting more sovereign than Canada was. You know, although Canada was a member, uh, Great Britain was really carrying the uh, carrying the water for for, for Canada at the uh, uh, at, at, at the at 
the League of Nations. Great Britain stopped uh, uh, this, this Kahe from speaking at the League of Nations, saying that uh, the, uh, the Haudenosaunee were not uh, uh, members of the League, uh, so that therefore uh, uh, shouldn't be able to speak. However, this Kahe had a lot of friends in, in, in Geneva because he was, a, Geneva loved him because they had a real, they had a real red Indian. In, uh, in Geneva, and uh, he was feted, and, and uh, people thought that he was just uh, 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 an amazing per, uh, 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 person. So uh, when he was denied uh, to speak to, to, the, to the League, the mayor of Geneva invited him over, uh, invited the League of Nations to the, to the uh, I believe it's the city hall, to a hall in, uh, in Geneva, I think it's the, it's a city hall, and where, where, uh, where uh, the Skahe gave the speech uh, that he would have given to the League of Nations, and, and he gave it to the, uh, to the government delegates that, that, that showed up at that, uh, at that event. There's a story of a little boy, by the way, uh, while the, the Skahe was, uh, uh, was in Geneva, and he was at some, some event, and this little boy kept tugging on, on his shirt, you know, and, uh, and uh, people were trying to tell him, the little boy, that don't, don't bother him. But, um, the, but the little boy was persistent. So this, uh, this guy had sat down and, and talked to him, and, uh, and, and he chatted with him. And, uh, and the little boy had a lot of questions, and he answered all his questions. And the little boy was satisfied. And then um, and, and that was it. I, I want to get back to that story, that little story later, because it's significant. Yeah. Um, so while the Canadian, while he was in, this guy here was in Canada, the Canadian guy was so upset. Uh, the Six Nations uh, Reserve in Ontario was still run by a traditional government. We had our own constitution, the great law of peace, or the Guyana law in, in, in our language, and uh, we still ran, we were still run by chiefs and clan mothers, you know, and, and, and up, up, up until 1924. There was, uh, so the, um, the government uh, invaded, the RCMP invaded Six, Six Nations in 1924 and invaded the Longhouse, you know, and took all our, 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 our symbols of uh, authority. Uh, and uh, padlocked the, uh, uh, the, the council house and then held mock elections. Uh, and, and that's how the elected council, the Indian Act, uh, came to Six Nations. And uh, it was an invasion. It was an overthrow of, of, of the people of the, of, of the Haudenosaunee at that, at that time. So we didn't accept this, this, uh, this uh, um, uh, overthrow. And uh, so now you have two governments in Six Nations. Uh, as in many uh, European communities, you, you have the uh, the traditional council, the traditional people still follow the, uh, uh, the, the Great Law of Peace, our, our Constitution, and you have, then you have the Indian Act uh, elected councils. That are, so you have these two kinds of uh, governments in each, in each one, and, and Six Nations is, is, is like that still, still, still today. This guy had never returned after he left uh, uh, Geneva in 2024. He never returned to Six Nations because he was in fear of being arrested. And, uh, and so he, he, uh, he went to a, a Tuscarora Reserve, which is just across the border in uh, northern uh, New York State. So it's as close as you can get to Six Nations. And where he lived uh, there for three years and he died. Some say died of a broken heart. He was shattered because when he left uh, to Geneva, he, everything was fine. You know, he had a, a government, and he, everything was uh, working the way he knew it all his life. And then when, so when he returned, the, 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 his uh, country was upside down. And so he was in fear of, of, of returning, fear of, of arrest. So he, he never returned and, and he died. And, uh, he died in, in Tuscarora. I'll, I'll fast forward now to uh, uh, a wound, after Wounded Knee. Wounded Knee, as, as you know, was a big confrontation in the United States, uh, which was uh, under a lot of uh, confrontation. You know, people died, uh, the National Guard was involved, etc. Uh, a year after Wounded Knee was over, uh, a, a, a bunch of, a lot of indigenous people gathered uh, in, in the United States, and, and the, they concluded that. You cannot get justice in, in, the, in, in the United States or Canada, like it was just impossible un, under, under the situation. So mm -hmm. they felt that they had to take their, uh, their, um, their argument internationally. So they started a campaign, uh, a movement to try to bring our, our issues to the United Nations, a League of Nations that was no longer existed, so they want to bring it to, to, the, to the United Nations. So they, um, uh, uh, under pressure from them, under lobbying, uh, a, a meeting was called. Um, uh, in, in 1977, the picture which I shall show you at the beginning. Next. So um, the next, uh, it, it was a it was a meeting uh, that was called it was called by it was an NGO conference. We weren't exactly meeting with states. Uh, it was an NGO conference, and I think I, I, I told you it was called the uh, uh, racism against the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. And about 250 people showed up, and there was a lot. A lot of people from from, from the uh, north central and, and south america i think there were a couple of maoris and and some sami 
as well from, from, from Scandinavia. And, and, they, and they, uh, they put pressure on, to, they were there to put pressure on the United States to take uh, our, our situation seriously. And that there's a difference between uh, the rights of indigenous peoples and the rights of minorities. And that's a fundamental difference that we have to uh, explain. This is another photo of, the, of our, our, uh, our, our people going in. That's Orange Lions on the, on the far uh, right-hand side. The Haudenosaunee, we sent about, about, uh, about 12 people. And uh, like in like the Skahe, we did not use Canadian travel uh, papers. We used our own passports. They created our own passports with a leather-bound passport. And we still use uh, uh, those passports today. When the mayor of Geneva uh, heard that we were there, uh, the Haudenosaunee was part of the speak delegation. He asked to meet with the Haudenosaunee. Uh, I remember when that little boy that was tugging on the uh, shirt of the Skahe, well, the little boy was now the mayor of Geneva mm -hmm. in, in 1977. And so they, the mayor of Geneva invited the Haudenosaunee and they feted them and uh, he was very, very impressed to see them. And, and that helped open the doors for us to get into, uh, into Geneva because of the passport issue, the passport. Uh, they, they, uh, Geneva didn't know whether they should let us, let us in the country where they, we arrived when, the, when our delegation arrived at the, uh, at the airport. But the mayor of Geneva was able to help our de delegation get into Switzerland. You can read about this, this meeting on, on this book called uh, Basic Call to Consciousness, the Haudenosaunee Address to the Western World. And that book, uh, you, can, you can find it on Amazon. There was a reprint a few years ago. And, and uh, you, you might want to look at it. There's some, some very good descriptions of the meeting and the speeches that were, that were made uh, during that. During, during that time. The creation of the Working Group on Indigenous Populations, uh, after the, um, uh, this meeting in 77 and, and, other, and other events, there were other meetings that, that came after that. They, um, uh, oops, what did I do? I touched this thing here, but I guess that's... Anyway, I'll keep on talking. Um, one of the things that we had to convince the United Nations was is that the difference between minority rights and indigenous rights, the rights of indigenous peoples, because that's a fundamental difference that people don't understand. Not, not everybody understands. Uh, minorities uh, and indigenous people have similar rights. You know, we have a right to our culture. You know, both, uh, we, have, we, both, we, both, we both have a right to our language, a right to our own, our own religion, or spirituality, or that we call it spirituality. Uh, you, know, you know, we can have our songs, our dances, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, you know. but the difference between minorities and indigenous is that indigenous people have a right to self-determination, to have a right to lands and territories and natural resources, and, uh, and, and actually we, we, like to, we exercise our rights collectively. And, and uh, that's the difference. Uh, I, I like to use, use a comparison like the um, Italian minority in Canada. You know, they, they come from Italy. And, and, and Italians in Canada, they can uh, speak their language, they can have their own schools in, in Italian, they can, they can you know, practice their culture, they, they can do you know, their food, uh, everything. You know, but they don't have a right to self-determination or a right to land and territories. Italians exercise that in Italy. That's where they exercise the right to self-determination and the right to land and territory. Indigenous people were from here, were raped from here. You know, and like the Squamish, the only other place they can exercise the right to self-determination is here. They can't go someplace else and exercise it. It has to be here. And that's the difference between minority rights and indigenous rights, and, and, and it took us a while to try to convince people of that. Still today, we have a hard time. Uh, some people say, well, what's the matter with you native people in Canada? You're just a minority like anybody else. No, we're not. There's a fundamental difference, and that's, and that's, that's the, the basis of that. Uh, so with that, uh, the, um, the, um, the, United, the United States uh, created this working group on indigenous populations in 1982, and this group was made of five uh, Human rights experts. It was it was a working group underneath the, the subcommission on the, on the promotion and protection of human rights. It was called something else at that time, but uh, basically uh, that was it. The, the the subcommission. There's the, the commission on human rights, the subcommission, which is a, a, a bunch of uh, human uh, rights experts, and then they make a different uh, working groups. And one of them was on indigenous populations. There were five of them, one from each region of the world: uh, Africa, Asia, uh, Latin America. Uh, Western Europe and, and, and other countries, including Canada, United States, Australia, New Zealand, and, uh, and Eastern Europe, and was, at that time the Soviet bloc. So um, uh, one person from each of those five regions were, were made up this working group. And this working group then, uh, when they had their meetings, when indigenous people attended, the, the thing that they told them to do is that we want our rights protected and uh, recognized and protected, and we want them to, to, to do a declaration on the rights of indigenous people. 
1982, that's when the process basically started. Uh, it more, more earnestly, it started more likely in 1984 when uh, they started drafting, uh, drafting text up on, the, on, on the declaration. Um, so that's, uh, that's basically the, the, the beginnings of, uh, of, of that. I, I got involved in 1987. And in, in 1987, I think there was only 12 articles that were that, at that time. And then by the time I finished that meeting, it was 18 articles. And then in, in, uh, uh, in 88, they added more articles, 89, 90. In, uh, in 1990, 91, 92, 93, the, the working group was, was one week long. And for those four years from 90 to 93, there were, the, the, the working group went to two weeks, one, one solid week on, on drafting. Uh, the declaration and another week on doing other other issues that that, that, that the, uh, the the working group uh, worked on. Finally, uh, and uh, and you have to remember the atmosphere that, that, that we were in at, at that at that time. Uh, uh, experts, uh, human rights experts, and uh, states and stuff like that are, are saying things that uh, indigenous people don't have a right self, don't have a right self determination. Yeah, yeah. and um, saying that. Uh, that this declaration will never see the light of day. It'll never go anywhere. The states are not going to allow indigenous people uh, to, have, to have their their rights recognized because of the, the most many states are on indigenous land. You know, they're just they're just not not going to do it. And also, a lot of human rights experts said that we don't have a right to self determination. That we're not peoples. That we're not equal to all other peoples. Mm -hmm. You'll notice the title of the working is called the Working Group on Indigenous Populations, and that's because governments did not want to call us peoples. Because peoples have rights, all peoples have rights of determination. It's international law. So they call us indigenous populations because populations don't have rights. A flock of ducks is a population; it doesn't have rights. You know, so uh, 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 you know, a population does not does not does not have rights. So that's why the, the governments use that uh, use that term populations, and that's why they like to use terms like uh, groups. Uh, they like to use the terms of, uh, uh, or individuals, uh, collectives, or communities. But they, they avoid at all costs using the term peoples because peoples have implies rights. And even uh, so, the S was a, was a big fight. Um, in the um, World Conference on Human Rights uh, in Vienna in, in uh, 1993, 94, I can't remember, um, they, they, they wouldn't use the term, they would not, they wouldn't use, put the S on the, on the term peoples. They, they call this indigenous, indigenous people, like one people, all indigenous people. Are just one people, whether you're an Inuit or you're or you're a Sami or you're a Maori or you're a Mohawk, you know we're all the same people. That's it. the uh, the the the, the, uh, the United Nations has two decades on on the, on the world's indigenous people. Even today, the second day, the second decade of the world's indigenous, the UN calls it calls it the second decade of the world's indigenous people. No S, because that's how much resistance states have. Against the, against the rights of, of, of indigenous peoples, so it hasn't disappeared, and we'll get on to more more, more about that. Well, WGD, uh, this is the working group on the, on the draft declaration, and that's the short shorthand hand form um, that, that goes through, it's fits to uh, segue into that because the uh, the official um, uh, title of this working group is is the working group on resolution 9532 because the states did not want to call it the Working Group on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, peoples because they wanted to avoid the word peoples, so they gave it a number. You know. So uh, we, but we, it, it was, the pet name was uh, Working Group on the, on the Draft Declaration. When the, um, when, when the Working Group on Indigenous Populations uh, finished drafting the text in, in 1993, the Year of Indigenous People, by the way, we, uh, we wanted 1992 to be the Year of Indigenous People. Uh, but, you know, Christopher Columbus and all that. Um, but Spain objected because Spain was celebrating Christopher Columbus and they didn't want to conf conflict the, the celebration with, of that with uh, indigenous people. So uh, as a consolation, we got 1993 as, as the year of indigenous people. So in 1993, they felt it would have been a good year to pass the declaration. And we did. And the, the last, last article that was agreed to in, in the declaration was Article uh, 3, which said indigenous people have a right to self-determination. And that was the, the principal point uh, and, and fundamental point of the of, of the declaration. 1993, in 1994, it went up to the to the to its uh, its uh, its superior body, the subcommission. The subcommission passed it without any changes, 
and then it went to the uh, Commission on Human Rights. Now, the Commission on Human Rights is different from the two under, uh, other bodies. The other bodies are human rights experts. The Commission is politicians. It, it's politicians, it's uh, people. So uh, the Commission on Human Rights is, is uh, made up of, of, uh, of uh, ambassadors. It's, pol it's a political body. And uh, it's not about human rights, it's about politics. So the Commission did not, well, the states did not like the Declaration on the Rights of, as a, of a, the Draft Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So they created their own working group, the Working Group on the Draft Declaration. And their, and their role was, and, and if I remember correctly, the terminology is, it says, to elaborate uh, a Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. It did not say to uh, study the Declaration that was written by the Subcommission and, 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 and the Working Group, but to elaborate. In other words, it, 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 it it even said that it, was, it would write its own declaration. That's how bad, that's how much states didn't like this, this, this declaration. Um, however, uh, in the negotiations to, to start the, the meeting, we agreed that the, uh, that the working group, that the, the, the draft declaration that came up from the, uh, from the subcommission and, and, the, and the working group on indigenous populations would be the basis of discussion. So we, we got, at least we, we won that. At the commission level, um, I have to explain to uh, another, another point about the working group on indigenous populations is that uh, it, there are only three kinds of people that can attend a meeting at, at the UN. You have to be a state, a member state, uh, a UN agency, or an NGO, a non-governmental organization. Many indigenous people refuse to register in the UN as a non-government because we're governments. You know, indigenous people are governments, so we refuse to do that. The Working Group on Indigenous Populations was the first body in the UN in 1982 to have an open door policy on allowing people, any, anybody, to attend a meeting. Uh, indigenous person, non uh, professors, you know, uh, lawyers, uh, you know, organizations, anything. You, you didn't have to be a registered NGO in the UN. So, so it was the only body like that in, in, in the UN from 1982 to 1995. Then when this working group uh, uh, was created, uh, then they, they also made those same rules for, for this working group. So this was the second body in the UN that had, had an open door policy, which is groundbreaking in the, in, in the, in the UN, uh, as limited as it was. However, in the meeting of the working group on, on, the, uh, on the draft declaration, you're at the commission level and you have uh, government representatives now, now in the room, and uh, they're the power and, and, and they have all the say and we have nothing. In there, um, it was an awful situation where uh, states could um, uh, w w control the floor. The states could speak, and and uh, NGOs were were uh, indigenous people. We sat in the back of the room, and uh, when we raised our hands to speak, we weren't being recognized. And and, and the and the chairman would only listen to what the states would. Once in a while, he, he would let, let us speak, but but we're talking about our rights, you know, our uh, stuff and this, and, and it was unacceptable. Uh, that this kind of, uh, we couldn't accept this kind of behavior. So in the second year, in 1996, uh, we, we walked out of the room. 99% uh, uh, of the indigenous people walked out and said that this is intolerable. You know, the resolution says that, uh, uh, that indigenous people, uh, states and indigenous representatives will, will elaborate this, this declaration. And if we can't take part, if we, if they won't, if we can't speak, then there's, there's, there's no reason for us to be in the room. So we walked out, but, you know, therefore jeopardizing the whole, the whole working group. After three or four days or a week of frantic negotiations, and I was right in the middle of it because I was chairing the, the Indigenous Caucus, and a lot of pressure put on both sides to get, to get us back into the room. We were pressuring states, states were pressuring us. Phone calls between Geneva and New York, the legal department getting all kinds of advice for looking. Different solutions like an Indigenous co-chair, like uh, you know, different, different things. Anyway, a solution was, was found where the, uh, the chairman said that, that there, there's, there's two levels of the meeting. There's the formal meeting and the informal meeting. In the formal meeting, only states can speak. So uh, in, in, in the negotiating sessions, it will be an informal uh, uh, meeting. Anybody can speak. And, and very importantly, indigenous representatives will be part of the consensus. In the United, Na in the United uh, Nations, when, you, when you're dealing about declarations and conventions, the, the decisions, the, the articles have to be by, by consensus. Everybody has to agree. All the states have to agree. So not, now, now we were part of the consensus. And, that, and that's the only working group that's ever been like that, and only one that's ever been there since. So in, indigenous people were part. So that, we accomplished that with that walkout. So we walked back in, and then we were able to take part. 
So that was a, a, a critical victory. The second part was is that states really wanted to gut the declaration, saying we wouldn't, wouldn't let that happen. So we had to stop any discussion about word changes, and because states wanted to change the text. So we, um, and they were very hostile to self-determination and stuff like that. So what we did, we had a strategy of no changes. We would engage states, we would go to the meetings, but we were, were not going to uh, uh, tolerate any, any, any changes to the text. And uh, that was also very effective. And uh, so we were able to stop uh, uh, changes uh, uh, to the text for eight years. From 1995 to 2003, we were able to hold them off. But one of the reasons why, we, another reason we were allowed to do it, the states were divided. The Judicial Caucus was solid, you know, like a, like a rock. We were not going to uh, uh, allow change to states were scattered. There's 191 countries and 191 opinions, but uh, and, and and in that room, there's not there's only about 40 or 50 states in, in, in the room. Uh, but they were all they were they were not united. Uh, there were some states like um, Denmark and Guatemala were were ready to accept the declaration, the draft declaration that, that was passed by the subcommission, and accept it and 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 go on. They they they're willing to live with it without any changes. And because states were divided, we were able to hold them off for eight years. But then around 2003, 2002, uh, Guatemala and Finland and, and other states were saying that we can't do that anymore. Our, our uh, other states in the region are saying that they, they, they will not pass the declaration unless there are some changes. And, and if they don't do that, they'll, they'll just destroy the work group. They'll shut it down and, and there'll, be, there'll be no declaration. So there has to be something. So now that changed the dynamic. We know that the states were no longer split and divided. They were they were united and and, and wanted to get changes. So um, some indigenous people now were, were were agitating now. Well, maybe we should soften our position a bit and and, and, and contemplate some 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 changes. Um, and what happened in 1993 was uh, CRP one conference from paper one, a proposal from by the Nordic countries: Norway, uh, Sweden, uh, Finland, Denmark. And one other country, I think New Zealand joined them, and uh, they made some proposed tech changes on a series of articles. And those tech changes, when they were put on the floor, and they were, we were blindsided by that, we, we, did, we didn't know it was coming, uh, was also supported by, uh, unofficially by some other indigenous people. And uh, therefore, that's when the cracks started showing about, then the indigenous people no longer, we, we no longer had a, um, a solid uh, a front of no changes. And then. Uh, so from uh, 2003 to 2006, there was uh, a lot of um, back and forth about about, um, about changes to the text, and then a lot of the, it was just a cascading uh, thing happened where more and more and more uh, uh, text was changed in, in, in all the articles. Uh, 